Thing. Now we are officially in the middle of the holiday season, and this year, of course, has been a challenge for all of us. And it's even harder to grapple with the challenges that COVID-19 presents when all we want to do is celebrate and see our friends and family during all of this. Today, I do want to continue our in-depth conversation about COVID-19. My first guest this morning is Keith Grant. He is the APRN Senior System Director of Infection Prevention for Hartford HealthCare. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. All right, so we are past Thanksgiving now. It's been about three days. No doubt people still gathered with friends and family. Uh, some people at this point, I would assume, might be starting to get an onset of symptoms, right, because of that gathering. What are you expecting? Yeah, so, you know, we spoke about this before Thanksgiving, and one of the things that we were most concerned about is obviously the potential of people getting together in large numbers and how this could impact um, the numbers throughout Connecticut, how it could impact individual families. But where timeline is concerned, so generally, biggest yield you will have for you know, testing for incubation period, day four to five. So slightly bit early, but it's not unusual for people to start developing symptoms um, 48 to 72 hours after being exposed. So what we do expect is to see somewhat of an uptick, um, uh, you know, as, as we move on from Thanksgiving. I noticed that a lot of people who are getting COVID, they hear that they're exposed to someone, right? So let's say you find out someone was, you were exposed to someone at Thanksgiving and you immediately a day or two go and get tested, that those tests are coming back negative, right? And then a couple days later, they might be getting tested again uh, and those are coming back positive. Exactly. So that's a very, very good point because a lot of people will get tested after exposure and that negative, initial negative test um, will give this sense of uh, reassurance that you know, the exposure didn't yield um, in a true exposure, and I'm, I'm not positive. But what that is and what you've explained is the actual incubation period itself. Keep in mind, incubation period can be as long as 14 days. Um, you know, there's some research now that's looking at shortening that actual time period or looking at shortening the quarantine period. But generally, um, scientifically, it's 14 days at this point. And the big, as I said before, initial testing, so if you test, uh, let's say before that four to five days, it's a lower probability that you will get back the appropriate result, the accurate result. At day 10 to 11, it's about 97 to 98% um, effective on that test, the, PC, the general the PCR test. Interesting. Okay, so if you found out that someone at your Thanksgiving gathering, for example, uh, tested positive, and you, a couple days later, you test negative, and you're like, okay, whew, but... If you're still nervous and you don't have an onset of, uh, onset of symptoms, but let's say five to seven days later after that exposure, you want to get tested again, that's where you'd get 97% accuracy? You'd get, at five to seven days, you'll get above 80%, closer to 90%. Okay. Um, after 10 days, you will get uh, 97 to 98%. Interesting. Okay. So what's your advice to someone if they find out someone at their dinner table or someone they were with tested positive? What should they be doing? Quarantine, isolate as soon as possible. So quarantine, so, you know, social distancing, physical distancing, very important. Most important, especially when you realize that you've been exposed. Um, quarantine and get tested. Uh, don't rely primarily on symptoms. Keep in mind about 81% of uh, individuals will have mild to no symptoms through this process. And even in, in without symptoms, being asymptomatic, you have the, the ability to pass this disease on. So definitely quarantine as soon as possible and, and get tested, schedule and, and go get tested as soon as possible, preferably within that four to five days at a minimum. And then again, still looking for symptoms, uh, appreciating that it's up to 14 days. So if you should get tested again, I would advise doing that after day 10. You know, it's so hard because it can be kind of confusing because where does the buck stop on who quarantines, right? Because a lot of people, you know, many of you at home may know someone. You might not have been, you know, physically in their presence, but you might know someone at this point who has had COVID just because of the numbers that we're seeing in Connecticut in this ramp up that we're experiencing. So, for example, let's say your kid goes to school and someone at their school, they had direct exposure to COVID-19. Um, that child is home and is quarantining for 14 days at this point. But, you know, it's hard. Like, as a parent, does that person have to quarantine if their child had primary exposure? Or should they continue on and go to work and do all of that? So a few things on that. So it depends on what the, the level of exposure that the child has. And I know in the setting of uh, schools, and especially with younger kids, it's hard to define 
exactly what that level of that was positive was symptomatic that changes from a uh, mechanical perspective it changes the propensity of actually spreading the disease itself the other piece of it is um, it really depends on the parents capability or, or ability to really quarantine from that child and normally I, th I think it's very very difficult so um, what I the advice that I would generally give is one of the key set of information that you need to get is whether or not this child is positive so get your child tested as soon as possible, and it will help you to get one more or one level of objective data that will help you to decide whether or not what's your next step for you, you and your family. We're going to be talking with the teachers union uh, in the next break here, the CEA executive director, Donald Williams. You know, schools, teachers are concerned, and, and they think after the Thanksgiving holiday that all schools in Connecticut should go fully remote because of the risk. Uh, there are many school districts that have already decided to do that. Uh, we've heard from the state that schools are safe, that people are following the guidelines, they're putting on masks, they're not letting their guards down, and that they're seeing more of a spread in social gatherings or family gatherings. But when you're looking at schools, you have all these kids coming in, um, you know, even if things are staggered and it's hybrid, how do you guarantee to teachers, because I would assume you can't, that they're safe going into the classroom? You can there's no way for you to give a 100% guarantee. What I can say is schools, now we've worked at a number of schools throughout Connecticut, schools have done an exceptional job in ensuring safety. If you look at clusters within schools, very, very, very small number. And I think there's so much, um, the data is very transparent. There's very, very, uh, you, very good evidence that schools have done an exceptional job in ensuring safety of families and of students. I think one of the things to to really focus on on this is the the fact that you know this is a plan and a process that's been in place for a very long time now i mean it's it seems like covid's been around for a while um the concept of some institutions deciding to close after thanksgiving that's that's a that's a credible approach because what you're looking at you're identifying that potential incubation period and you're saying all right this is a chance of you have contracting something while enjoying Thanksgiving, and now we're gonna keep you out to watch the incubation and appreciate incubation period. However, I do also appreciate that a lot of schools have a significant amount of mitigation strategies in place that I believe does a very good job in protecting kids and their families. You had touched on this before, uh, the quarantine period and how uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention was considering shortening that time that they're asking people to stay home and self-quarantine. So right now, we've all been told 14 days. You get exposed, stay home for 14 days. Even a negative test, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that you're uh, in the clear. Uh, now they're looking at, from what I was reading, 7 to 10 days. Explain why sure. they're considering that if medical evidence shows that on day 14, you could possibly have an onset of symptoms or you could be positive with COVID. That's correct. So... And um, there's a number of papers that are out right now. I think Harvard has a study, Yale has a study as well. I mean, this is also based on the use of other processes. So one of the process to include te proper testing. So if you quarantine for 14 days without getting tested, the actual yield from it is based on the studies. If you quarantine for seven days and get tested day one of exposure and day seven to 10 of exposure, the actual yield from that is as much as, if not better than a quarant full quarantine for 14 days. So it encourages people to test more um, and test more appropriately. And with that uh, approach, you have the ability. So if everyone's exposed and you're testing them on day zero or day one, and you're testing them on day seven or day 10, and the other scope is if everyone's exposed and you're saying quarantine for 14 days, keep in mind at end of the 14 days, I still have no idea if you're positive or you're negative, if the appropriate timing for testing wasn't done. So I think that approach that's being, that I assume is going to be proposed by the CDC within the next couple, coming days, um, uh, that approach within itself has different pieces to it, which include proper timing for testing. Uh, I think it could work. Interesting. Okay. Do you think that uh, the state would follow suit if, if the CDC changes. I mean, we've been following the CDC guidelines as a state, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, you know, it's the interesting thing about it is if you if you really think about this, just pure logics without you know all the science and complicated languages ar around it. If you have someone that's within your office that's testing on day one and testing on day seven or day ten, 
uh, or someone that just stayed out of the office for 14 days. Keep in mind, if that person is positive on the 14 day, became became positive on we know on the 10 we test we're capturing about. If if that person comes back and is not tested and was exposed enough to be positive, you're still having someone that's exposed and positive within the house, within your work area or within the household, so to speak. Now, if the appropriate timing for testing was done, you have definitive knowledge that this person, 97 to 98% of the time is negative. I think that's, that's kind of the easiest way to look at it. It's a higher probability of capturing your positives. Yeah, no, that, that does make sense. Interesting. Um, you know, we've got a lot of people who are planning now for the Christmas holiday, and they're kind of crossing their fingers and hoping that they're, they're going to be able to see their loved ones. I think a key thing here, though, is that by Christmas time, we know what the numbers are likely to show, right? C can we turn this thing around by then, or is this still a train on the tracks that's not going to be able to turn around and we should just prepare? You know, I would like to say by Christmas we are trending down. I don't think, I think even if we're trending down or even if we're increasing but at a decreasing rate, um, I th we're not, I don't foresee us having the ability um, based on just pure numbers and epidemiology to at that point enjoy a uh, normal Christmas. And that's, you know, being honest. I think, however, at that point in time, so about around Christmas time, you know, based on what we're hearing with the vaccination availability, the vaccine availability, within the next few weeks, we'll know more about this, but about the end of December, um, last few weeks in December, beginning of January, we should have that as a tool. Um, and that will change. I think it changes the conversation a significant amount. Yeah. It is not all doom and gloom, everyone. Vaccines are on the horizon here. How hopeful are you? I mean, you're talking about the end of December that, um, you know, the initial vaccinations would go out, which we understand would be frontline health care workers, um, yes. as well as those in really high risk categories like nursing homes. You know, what, what, are, what should people expect with the vaccine distribution here in Connecticut? Yeah, so I think one of the first things is appreciating this is, a very it's going to be a very challenging process it's going to be it's going to stress the collaboration or collaborative effort that's needed between local and state government and uh, federal government as well it's going to um, rely on the citizens of connecticut and citizens of this wonderful country to uh, um, believe in this process right so from a scientific perspective pure science as it stands right now the vaccine has proven to be effective, 95% effective, um, about 95% effective. Where distribution is concerned, there's some challenges. There's obviously one vaccine that needs an extreme temperature for storage. Um, there is two doses versus like with a flu vaccine, it's a single dose. But if you look at what Connecticut has done over the last few weeks, you know, um, prior to this uh, second wave, Connecticut has done exceptionally well in implementing processes. The citizens have done exceptionally well in following guidelines that have led us to a very, very low number. And appreciating that this is a new tool, there's people that are already calling the offices asking as soon as this is available, um, let us know and we'll, we will come and, and, and get it. So I think at this point, the, the thing that we should be doing as leaders and as um, you know, any opportunity to speak to the public is the fact that there is a vaccination coming and there's a vaccine coming. It's two dosage. Um, it's very effective at, at, for the best of our knowledge. This what we know now is 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 really good. Um, and uh, if you know, effective vaccine should help us uh, significant significantly. With that in mind, advice to people over the next few weeks. You know, appreciate your family. This is the season for it. Do it as safe as possible. Um, there is tools, there is information that's available if you feel like you've been exposed. Um, reach out to your healthcare provider, um, have conversation with your family. One of the things that I said in the very beginning of this, identify people within your family that are highest risk. People that are highest risk for bringing, bringing it in, the disease in, to the family group, um, and people who are highest risk, risk to be impacted by the disease process. Um, and keep those people safe and separate. Um, and the final thing that I will say on this is, 
you know, there is definitely light at the end of the tunnel. And it's not just with the vaccine, it, it, with the belief that us as healthcare providers have in the citizens of Connecticut, that we will continue to do the right thing. Um, and we will get the numbers back to a low and manageable level. I know many people are glad to hear that and really looking forward to that. Thank you for everything you're doing uh, as a frontline worker as well. We, we appreciate that so much. Keith Grant, APRN, Senior System Director of Invec Infection rather Prevention for Hartford HealthCare. Thank you so much for your expertise this morning. Thank you. Have a good day. All right.